Energy Matters Podcast. Hi everyone, thanks for tuning in. I am your host Kasim Alokula from Texas A&M University Society of Petroleum Engineers Student Chapter, TAMO SPE. The aim of this podcast is to discuss and explore some specific topics about the energy industry in general and the oil and gas in specific, while covering some related topics in environment, economics, policy, and many more. Howdy and welcome to another enlightening episode of the Energy Matters, the podcast where we delve into the latest advancement, groundbreaking innovations, and the brilliant minds shaping the future of the energy landscape. I'm your host, Kasa Malakla, Tamo SPE's president. And today's episode is truly special as we are honored to have a distinguished guest, a luminary in the field whose name resonates with excellence, Professor John Lee. Thank you, Professor Lee, for being a guest on this podcast. Your dedication and impact on the energy sector are truly inspiring, and we are very eager to explore the depths of your expertise. Well, thank you, Kasim. I'm very honored uh, to be allowed to be part of your program. I thank think you. It's very important potentially very helpful. Thank you. Okay, before we dive into the heart of our conversation, I will introduce Dr. Lee. Dr. John Lee, holder of the DVG Endowed Chair and Professor of Petroleum Engineering at Texas A&M University, is a distinguished figure in the oil and gas industry field with a rich and varied career, holding bachelor, master's, and PhD degrees in chemical engineering from the Georgia Institute of Technology. He began his professional journey with ExxonMobil, specializing in integrated reservoir studies. Dr. Lee later assumed a prominent role in academia, becoming a Regents Professor of Petroleum Engineering at Texas A&M. His expertise extended to unconventional gas reservoirs, where he served as a consultant with S.A. Holditch and Associates. Notably, he played a pivotal role as an academia engineering fellow with the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission, SEC, contributing significantly to the modernization of SEC roles for reporting oil and gas reserves. A prolific author with four textbooks published by the Society of Petroleum Engineers, Dr. Lee has served numerous accolades, including the prestigious Locust Medal, the Goyler Distinguished Service Medal, and honorary membership from SPE. His membership in the U.S. National Academy of Engineering and the Russian Academy of Natural Sciences further underscores his impact and recognition in the field. Dr. Lee's illustrious career includes leadership roles, impactful publications, and influential contribution to the advancement of petroleum engineering. Thank you again, Dr. Lee. And now we can start with our questions. All right. If we are going to start with your early career and education, uh, could you please share a bit about your journey in the oil and gas industry, starting from education at the Georgia Institute of Technology, and what specifically made you interested in this industry? I, I became involved in the industry when I accepted a summer job with what is now ExxonMobil. Uh, previous to that, in my education, I was a co-op student at Georgia Tech, and my vision was to work in the nuclear industry, and I worked at the Oak Ridge National Lab every other term for uh, most of five years Mm -hmm. to earn enough money to go through school. But uh, one of my professors recommended me to the ExxonMobil interviewers, and I interviewed, and I thought, the kind of thing that they described sounded very interesting, so I thought I would take a look at it, and I accepted a, a summer internship in Houston. They actually wanted me to come to work with a bachelor's degree, but I thought I would be better served by going on to graduate school before I went to work, and this would give me a chance to have a look at the company. Mm-hmm. That first summer really sold me on the on the industry. Wow. The people that I worked with were exceptional. Mm-hmm. And the problems that we had to try to solve were very challenging, very interesting, and really very much in line with the fundamentals that I covered in my coursework at Georgia Tech. Mm-hmm. So after that first summer, you know, I knew what I was going to do. Uh, for a career. Uh, I continued in graduate school. I had another summer internship before I graduated, 
And then I interviewed no other companies well, upon graduation. I knew where I was going to go, so I went to work permanently in Houston with the production research group mm-hmm. of the company. Okay, so this was after finishing your PhD? Uh, the permanent job was immediately after finishing my PhD. I, okay. I graduated on a Friday, and I, my first day on the job was on the following Monday. Wow, <laughs> that's great. All right, so you joined ExxonMobil in 1962, right? Yes. So what roles did you take at the company? You start, You said that you joined the uh, production group, but what specifically some of the roles that you uh, took at the company and how you made it to be more delved into uh, integrated reservoir studies? Well, my, my, my first assignment actually was to try to look at how to deal with stuck pipe mm-hmm. and drilled wells, uh, and that was a good project. Uh, I can't say we solved the problem, but we uh, we got a lot of insight into the cause of the problem. Mm-hmm. And uh, after that, uh, I got my first look at hydraulically fractured wells, and I was I was really assigned as part of the hydraulic fracturing group. But my job was reservoir characterization with mm-hmm. that group. And so I got into pressure transient test analysis, even though, again, I wasn't formally part of the pressure transient group. Mm-hmm. ExxonMobil had a another group which provided technical service to ExxonMobil affiliates worldwide. And the director of that group uh, saw some of my work and thought that I would fit very well in that group, and and I moved there. And so fairly early in my career, I got involved uh, with reservoir studies, not yet integrated, but Mm -hmm. reservoir studies. And I did uh, reservoir studies for Exxon's large assets in uh, several different countries in the world. And uh, that was my background training. And then I was given a, a training assignment in Exxon Mobil's South Texas district, which was headquartered at that time in Kingsville, Texas, mm-hmm. uh, taking care of properties on the King Ranch. And my job was to design water floods for several large reservoirs on the King Ranch. Mm-hmm. Uh, that proved to be quite a good learning experience for me, and I, I think it went well. In fact, it uh, it went better than I had any right to expect. I looked at a total of three reservoirs, which collectively had about 300 million barrels of uh, potential reserves, and I estimated the reserves with and without a water flood, and it turned out that as the reservoirs were water flooded, uh, the estimates turned out to be within 1% of what actually happened. Now, I'd like to claim that's because of my expertise. Actually, that's, of course, mostly serendipity, yeah. but at least uh, it, it was a rewarding experience, and. Uh, it, it helped my professional register, uh, uh, image. Mm-hmm. Now, while I was with ExxonMobil, and really depending on this work with the fracturing group, which was developing some exciting new fracturing technology, I had an opportunity to provide some training in ExxonMobil's uh, training program for engineers really throughout the company who would come into Houston uh, for short courses a week or two weeks long. And I found I really liked that. You know, that wasn't my main job. It's just something I did because of my background in the fract- with the fracturing group. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I really liked that. And at that time, I was offered a job in academia 
because I had developed somewhat of a reputation within the company Mm -hmm. for training and pressure transient testing. Mm -hmm. And so really that led to my academic career. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, I left the company for a while, and really my first job in academia was in at Mississippi State University, and the department head there oh, wow. was a classmate of mine mm-hmm. in, in, at Georgia Tech in graduate school, mm-hmm. and that was Dr. Bill McCain, who later became a professor at Texas A&M. Yes. I, I really enjoyed that, but uh, I, I saw fairly soon that my opportunities were limited there, mm-hmm. and so I went back to ExxonMobil, and here's where I became deeply involved in integrated reservoir studies. Okay. So, uh, you know, I had that first short assignment, as I've described, and mm-hmm. then with the integrated reservoir studies, uh, what I did is had a group that <coughs> that studied Exxon's major domestic oil and gas reservoirs, and we designed depletion plans for those reservoirs. It, they required unitization, uh, which I'm not going to elaborate on, but mm-hmm. we had to get all the operators and royalty interest owners and so forth to agree to a plan where we injected whatever was necessary yep. uh, in order to enhance recovery. And, and we successfully were able to form these units despite it's what 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 was it the start some pretty serious opposition so i had an opportunity uh to work with the group and ultimately head the group mm-hmm. that did this and i also had an opportunity to try to persuade people to try to do something that was in their interest but which coming in they were kind of skeptical about you know uh, well, here's Exxon Mobil again. They're trying to take advantage of us, which wasn't true. We're trying, of course, what we were doing was good for Exxon Mobil. Of course, but it was also good for all the other working interest owners and royalty interest owners. And my job was to persuade people that that was the right track. Mm-hmm. I really enjoyed that part of my work. Mm-hmm. Okay, after I'd been at this, I, I spent a total of 15 years okay. with ExxonMobil. Wow. And then the department head in petroleum engineering at Texas A&M University said, uh, we'd like for you to come work with us as a teacher mm-hmm. in the petroleum engineering department. Well, I knew from that work and training with ExxonMobil that I would probably really like that, my experience at Mississippi State was really quite rewarding. Uh, Texas A&M clearly had the resources to provide a, a good future for someone like me, so mm-hmm. I accepted that job. Uh, after I was at A&M a few years, uh, no, a few months, excuse me, uh, ExxonMobil's chief engineer mm-hmm. uh, called me and said, okay, you've you've gotten over your midlife crisis now. It's time for you to come back <laughs> well, with ExxonMobil. So I, I had to make a big, big decision at that point. You know, okay. Obviously, there are going to be a lot greater financial rewards of course. with a big company like ExxonMobil. But I was becoming more and more interested in what we did at A&M, so I decided to stay at A&M. Wow. And the rest is history. Mm-hmm. Fascinating. I really appreciate you sharing your early career, which was also like a combination between um, industry experience and also academia. And definitely it was a hard decision to choose between a and and uh, ExxonMobil. But uh, one question here. So what was the status of A&M in terms like uh, of reputation in the petroleum engineering at that time? Like was it, for example, as it is now like ranked among like the top universities in petroleum engineering? That's a, that's a very good question. Uh, the reputation of A&M was very good at the level of producing excellent bachelor's degree level mm-hmm. petroleum engineering. Okay. A&M had a graduate program, but it was not nearly as well accepted okay. in the industry at that time. There was... 
there was really not that much of a research program. Uh, we concentrated on developing these people that would go out and take a job after the bachelor's degree. So mm -hmm. good reputation at the undergraduate level, more of an unknown okay. at the graduate level. Okay, cool, cool. Thank you. All right, so in 1980, you became the executive vice president of technology at S.A. Holdage and Associates. How can you describe that experience and what was different from your previous experience at ExxonMobil? Okay, well, S.A. Holdage was a company founded and headed by Steve Holdage, mm -hmm. who was a professor at Texas A&M, yeah. but w we were and are allowed to uh, do consulting on the side, and uh, many professors uh, who kind of have an entrepreneurial spirit uh, form their own companies, uh, which they can do as long as they fulfill their obligations at the university. Well, Steve uh, formed this company, and I worked with him on a joint research project at A&M dealing with uh, s stimulating, hydraulically fracture stimulating yep. tight gas reservoirs. And here, I, again, I used what I had learned about pressure transient testing to get a reservoir description, like what's the permeability in these reservoirs when we fracture them, how much improvement in productivity can we design for, uh, these sorts of, you know, what uh, kind of fracture length do we need, what kind of fracture conductivity. These sorts of questions can be helped by de describing a reservoir with pressure transient test and then and then fracturing them and then testing them post-fracture to see in detail what we got. So uh, I, I, I joined Steve and soon became the executive vice president in charge of technology. There were other exec, there was one other executive vice That's president course. which yeah. was in charge of operations in the company. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, that's how I got involved with that. And, and this really helped me at A&M, and what I, what I did at A&M really helped me with S.A. Holdings and Associates. And so I, I stayed with that company on a part-time basis through uh, almost the year 2000. Wow. Yeah. I love how you connected like your experience at ExxonMobil, how it helped you at SA Holdage and Associates, and then the experience that you get that you got at that consulting company, how it also helped you at your uh, research at Texas A&M when you like went to academia. All right, so now let's move to the uh, second part, which is teaching and research, which um, you are very known about at Texas A&M and in the industry. So. You talked about uh, the transition that happened between um, to industry to academia. So could you highlight some of the key areas of research that you have been involved in during your time as a faculty member at Texas A&M University? Well, early on, as we've already described, uh, my research was uh, primarily involved with reservoir and hydraulic fracture characterization in tight gas reservoirs. Uh, and I really concentrated on that for many years, but uh, uh, Steve Holditch and I kept in, you know, close communication about things to do. And at these times, it was clear that there was a need to take a look at oil and gas reserves and quantifying those reserves, which, uh, you know, is, is, is somewhat related to what we can do with pressure transient testing, but it involves a lot of other technologies. So, so finally, Steve said, you know, w we really need to set up a reserves course at Texas A&M, and we need, to get, we need to get into research in yep. that area, because at that time, A&M was really doing nothing in this area, and, and most universities mm -hmm. were not interested uh, in this particular area of quantifying reserves. Yep. So, 
I thought about it. I thought, you know, this this would mean switching out of something that I had become comfortable with, yep. but moving into another area. So I said, okay, uh, I'll I'll start a course in here, and mm-hmm. we'll see what we can do. Uh, and I moved into reserves, and turned out to be the right thing to do at the right time yep. because. Uh, I st- you know I stayed there for a few years. Uh, S. A. Holditch ultimately sold the company to Schlumberger, mm-hmm. and uh, while Schlumberger is a great company, I I was really not interested in working primarily with a with a large company. This this really would have interfered with what I could do at A&M. Mm-hmm. But I, I, I stayed with the reserves work uh, at Texas A&M, which we had begun. And there was a push in the industry that told the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission, uh, you know, or essentially demanded of the uh, Securities and Exchange Commission that we do something to modernize the SEC reserve regulations. And so uh, the SEC put an ad in a, uh, well, they sent out an ad, which I don't think anybody ever saw. I don't know who they sent it to, but there was a notice published in the Wall Street Journal that the SEC wanted someone with academic credentials in reserves to come join them and look at the prospect of modernizing their reserves reporting rules. Mm -hmm. Well, see, I had built this background by working in reserves at A&M now for several years. Uh, One of my colleagues at A&M saw this ad. I really didn't read the Wall Street Journal article, Uh but he said, why don't you apply for this position? They're they're advertising for an academic engineering fellow. Wow. Okay. I applied, Mm -hmm. and I got the job. Wow. (laughs) Now, I don't know if anybody else even applied, but uh, anyhow, I did. Uh, This meant moving to Washington and working with the SEC staff uh, in uh, modernizing the oil and gas reporting rules. You know, that was another huge opportunity for me and an opportunity to become uh, much more widely known in the industry and an opportunity to really help exactly. it with something that really needed to be done. So I spent a year and a half in Washington uh helping modernize the rules, really sort of leading the team that did this. I worked with a lawyer who drafted the rules to make sure that uh, from a wording standpoint, they met all the standards. Okay. But uh, uh, again, I just, by serendipity, happened to be in the right place at the right time. Yeah. So at that time, did you stop working at the Texas A&M when you were like in Washington? No, I was still an employee at Texas okay. A&M. I was, uh, in a sense, on on leave, mm-hmm. uh, working full time in Washington. Okay. Uh, on on the rules, and okay. so maintain my home here in College Station. My wife flew up to Washington. We had a small apartment there, uh-huh. and she came up. Uh, every other week and spent a few days and then came back home. Uh, so our travel expenses were pretty high. Yeah, but for sure. We were, we were able to get, keep things going, yeah. able to maintain our house. That's great. Uh, and then in uh, December of 2008, I finished that work and mm-hmm. came back full-time to A&M. Okay, that's great. So you started mentioning about the SEC. So your role as an engineering fellow there like helped a lot, uh, especially uh, in playing a crucial role in modernizing the reserves reporting regulations. Could you please share some insights into the challenges faced during that process and the impact of this on the industry? Well, 
when I got to Washington to work on these rules, uh, many on the SEC staff were very dubious about how much, if anything, we should do uh, and uh, what we did, they, they had their opinions about the best way forward. Mm -hmm. At the start, I was just kind of a member of the team uh, which they had envisioned as just giving advice to the full-time staff there with the SEC. Uh, I had another lucky break, and this again is kind of serendipity, but uh, uh, after a few months there being acquainted, becoming acquainted with the SEC procedures, we had a, a hearing with all the SEC commissioners. Uh, the SEC has five commissioners, three from the party uh, that's in power in the executive. In other words, if it's a Republican president, as it was when I started, then there would be three uh, Republican commissioners and two Democratic commissioners. Mm -hmm. uh, well, anyhow, uh, we had this hearing, and, and the five commissioners at that time really directed the hearing. For some reason, the head of the group that I was working with, it's called a corporation finance division of the SEC, and it's a very large division in there. Uh, he, he made an interesting decision, and I, to this day, I don't know why he did it, but uh, we had scripted things to say at this hearing, those of us working with this effort, and, you know, I had what was planned for me by the by the SEC staff was, you know, to speak up at a few points about some fairly minor issues. But the head of that division, for some reason, instead of allowing people uh, to follow the script, he immediately called on me in a question-and-answer fashion for the entire duration of the hearing uh, to talk about what needed to be done and why it needed to be done and what we were going to do about it, and nobody else really was allowed to say anything. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, because of my experience, it goes all the way back to ExxonMobil and working with those working interest owners and royalty interest owners and unitizing reservoirs, yeah. uh, I did what I think turned out to be a pretty good job. Exactly. That that gave me credibility mm -hmm. with the SEC staff. And that, that hearing was recorded, and a lot of people in the industry, including many back in Houston and other places, uh, uh, were able to look at recordings of that hearing, and they liked what I said. So that was a really, that led to a really major milestone in my career. Uh -huh. Because from that point forward, uh, I was allowed to lead the technical aspects mm. of that effort to get those rules changed. Now, again, many of the people in the SEC thought, well, at most we might do some tweaking, tweaking of existing rules. I envisioned a rather complete overhaul. Yeah. You know, the S SPE's PRMS mm -hmm. rules uh, were adopted in first in 2007. Yeah. And I was acquainted with them, and I proposed to the SEC that its rules uh, should be very close to PRMS. Yeah. You know, that that was intended to become a, a universal language for reserves, definitions, and I thought it's really well thought out. It had contributions from many very smart people, and we ought to adopt that. Because of this credibility that I was able to gain with the SEC, I was able to sell that idea for the most part. Not fully, mm -hmm. but for the most part. And so the modernized SEC rules are actually pretty close to PRMS for the most part. There, there are some major exceptions, and uh, those exceptions uh, really were part of the difficulties that we had in working with these rules. For example, one thing that industry really 
wanted very badly was to change the rule which said when, when we evaluate reserves and use certain costs and prices, the SEC's position had been that those prices had to be the prices on the last day of the fiscal year of a company's operations. Single day, those were the prices. And if you think about it, you know, prices jump around all over the place. Yes. And if that last day is a is a bad day for the industry, there's, uh, you know, bad things have happened. Congress is attacking the industry or something like that. Uh, then the price would be low, and that would reduce people's reserves. On the other hand, if there was a big political upset, a war in the Middle East, for example, or something, yeah. Yeah. well, prices might be high exactly. temporarily. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it just didn't make any sense. But uh, almost to the end, the SEC's accounting staff insisted that the prices need to be the price on the last day of the fiscal year. Mm-hmm. And... Fortunately, we were able to turn that around. I, I bring this up as an example because my experience there showed how important it is that we negotiate with people who initially have different opinions yep. from our own and try to resolve these using logic. Yep. And and uh, we finally were able to get this changed. Now, some parts of the rules... I don't like. Mm -hmm. I didn't like at the time, but, you know, we have to compromise and get what we can. Yeah. Okay. So we came up with drafts of rules, and then there was an election, and a Democrat Mm -hmm. was elected president while I was still there. Okay. All right. When When the Democrat was elected president, a lot of the SEC staff, uh, at, at higher levels, because a lot of these are really political appointees. They resigned from the SEC. Oh. We have new commissioners. Uh-huh. We'd convinced the old commissioners that we were going in the right direction, but now we have new commissioners yes. to c- convince, and now we have three Democrats and two Republicans. Wow. So we had to persuade them <laughs> yes. that what we had was not political in intent, mm-hmm. that... Uh, we had come up with some rules after all these months of negotiation which were to the public's benefit in general. But I had to convince uh, some new commissioners, and in particular some new Democratic commissioners, that what we had done was not favoring Republicans, uh, not favoring Democrats, but something that was in the public interest. Mm -hmm. Well, all the bosses had bailed out. Yeah. yeah. And, and and these negotiations were going on in my last month there, which was December of 2007. I believe it was 2007. It might be 2008. Anyhow, okay. my last month. Uh-huh. And everybody's gone, and uh, we, the lawyer who drafted the rules and I basically had to carry the ball Mm -hmm. in that last month and talk to these individual commissioners and convince them that we were the good guys. Exactly, yeah. But we, you know, we didn't have any management to assist us. They're all gone. Yeah. Uh, On the the next to last day that I was in Washington, (laughs) uh, I packed up all my stuff from my apartment ready to put it in the car or on the moving van, ready to come back to Houston without that final approval from that final commissioner. So the lawyer and I went in and talked to him. Mm -hmm. He's a Democrat. Mm -hmm. We convinced him, but I didn't know at the time, that what we had was in the public interest. So we talked to him. He didn't say anything much then. I went home thinking, has all this effort, all this work that we've done for the last year and a half, has it been for naught? Is he going to not approve? Because I'm leaving. Yes. You know, my time's up. Exactly. So uh, is it all, will it all have been from naught? Well, I went home not knowing. Mm-hmm. Uh, when I got back to my, point, uh, my apartment, I got a call the next morning from the lawyer, and he said this commissioner had approved 
the Ooh. proposed rules. Wow. <laughs> so I was able to go home satisfied. Exactly. Now, yeah. y- you asked in your earlier question mm-hmm. you know, several minutes ago, yes. you know, what I learned in this. Well, what I learned is how to, you know, the process of negotiating for what you want with people that initially are quite skeptical. Yeah. So uh, we were able to do this. The rules were adopted uh, uh, pretty much as we had drafted them. There was mm-hmm. some tweaking, but not much. Mm-hmm. And uh, and then I came back to A&M and resumed my academic career. Wow, that's so good. I really appreciate the way you articulated the issue and then the challenges that you faced at the end, like the lesson that you learned, which is like the way you can negotiate and come up to a solution that's satisfactory for everyone but this is basically because like you were convincing them from your because you are coming from a strong technical background and you had like all of the like the equipment needed for the negotiation all right so um now we'll move to another aspect of the questions here which is back again to academia but it's more into the textbook authorship so you've authored several textbooks including well testing gas reservoir engineering pressure transient testing and applied well testing interpretation how did you approach writing these books and how do you see these textbooks contributing to the education and training of future petroleum engineers well again uh, there's an interesting bit of history here Mm -hmm. Uh, the first book was well testing which was published in something like 1982 Mm -hmm. Uh, i was invited to be part of a team to develop a textbook on reservoir characterization yeah there was a well logging expert for example on that team i was in pressure transient testing uh we had a coring person that was involved uh i joined that team uh never having written anything of huge significance before uh but i joined that team and then the others all bailed out they saw how hard it was to write i stuck with it but of course i couldn't say much about logging i just wrote about my area of expertise Mm -hmm. which was pressure transient testing worked with an editor at spe working through this process of learning how to write a textbook you know and and that first textbook well testing that was a major milestone in my career the other major milestone was the sec rules yeah uh uh, so i did that um that textbook uh was very simple and easy to understand and just covered some fundamentals turned out to be that's what the industry wanted that's yeah. what schools wanted, yeah. something simple that just focuses on the fundamentals and all the fine, finer points. Uh, we can leave that for later for technical papers and so forth. Mm-hmm. But that's how I got started, and then I was asked to write other textbooks as time went on. Yeah, that's great. Uh, your textbooks are all over the world, and you are very famous uh, when it comes to what testing um, especially that most of the schools are adopting your uh, textbooks in their curriculum. So congratulations. Uh, since we started talking about SPE, the Society of Petroleum Engineers, your contribution to this uh, organization are extensive. Um, how has been part of SPE influenced your career and what role do professional societies play in advancing the field? Well, SPE has played a, uh, a really important role in my career. And uh, from my early days in Houston working with ExxonMobil, hmm. starting in about 1962, uh, I volunteered to be on SBE committees. I was on a committee during that first year. I remained on committees from that point forward and went from one committee to another uh, working. I was pretty particularly interested in working with student affairs Mm -hmm. and uh, so I worked with uh, with student affairs in the Gulf Coast I became involved with the Texas A&M student chapter of SPE Mm -hmm. and uh, I came up to every monthly meeting because that's that's what we had then one meeting a month unlike what you guys are able to do now (laughs) but I came up to every meeting from Houston Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, got involved with that sort of thing more and more. Mm-hmm. Eventually, I uh, 
became part of SBE committees dealing with student affairs largely yeah. on a national and ultimately international level, became chair of those committees. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I helped SBE organize, well, improve uh, regional student paper contests, yeah. which I became uh, very fond of as a just a huge learning opportunity for students. Exactly. Students need to learn how to present. That's going to have such an impact in their professional careers. So I got involved with the student paper contest because of what it could do for student development. On a regional level, I helped SBE organize the first international student paper contest. Wow. Oh, I remember that well. You know, we had this international student paper contest. We reserved this enormous room at uh, in at the uh, convention center in Houston uh -huh. this enormous room in which students were going to present in this contest and the contest started and, <laughs> and the audience was virtually zero oh my god I'm, well it was an it was a new event but exactly. it was really quite a quite a shock to the SBE staff member hmm. that I was working with and and you know I was disappointed but it 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 grew into what something that really has become quite important and I think very helpful to the students. For sure. Anyhow, by just getting involved from the start in committees. Now, one of the things that you'll find in working with SBE committees that most committee members really don't do very much. Mm -hmm. So those who contribute and work hard on the committee will advance rapidly yeah. through this committee structure. Mm -hmm. So I did. Uh, eventually, I became a, a member of the board of directors of SPE. Really, that was in recognition for all this work over the years yeah. with student affairs and other areas. I, I branched out from that start. Mm -hmm. But uh, in doing that, I made an enormous number of contacts yeah. within the industry, uh, which uh, I cherish even to this day. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, you you played a really big role in uh, SP and with Texas A&M University Society of Petroleum Engineers. You're still um, supporting us with the student paper contest, which is happening tomorrow, and also with uh, other aspects uh, of the events that we are organizing. Um, now, let's talk about some of the awards and recognitions, but, you know, like, you have a lot afterwards and your list of honors is extensive including for example being elected to the u.s national academy of engineering national academy of natural sciences receiving the locus medal and the degoiler distinguished service medal from spe uh, recently you've been uh, recognized as one of the spe legends of hydraulic fracturing in 2023 so how do these recognitions impact your approach to your work and how do you for example, envision their importance in petroleum engineering? Well, I, I, I really never actively sought this kind of recognition. It, it really came to me because I was one of those people that would work hard in committees, and I was recognized for that. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd say two or three major reasons for some of some of this recognition the first uh, was the textbook yes that i wrote for sure because when you write a textbook if it's well received as the well testing textbook was you know you become known to a large number of people and on the basis of that textbook my my first major recognition in spe was receipt of the SPE Reservoir Engineering Award. Mm -hmm. That that has since been split into several parts, but uh, early on, it was the Reservoir Engineering Award. There was only one. Uh, uh, I think I was the third person in history uh, to receive that award. Wow! A again, it was because of the well testing text. For sure. Because yeah. people liked it. You know, purely and simply. Mm -hmm. uh, that award and the publicity led to other recognition. That recognition, in turn, 
led to being nominated for, without my knowledge, without any campaigning, to the uh, U.S. National Academy of Engineering. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, and that in turn was, was a component of why I w had the opportunity to go work with the SEC. These things build on one another. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, it's... It's not mysterious how these things happen. For sure. they, they, they happen because of hard, dedicated work in small, seemingly insignificant committees with SBE over the years. And if you do that, if, if anybody wants to do that, if you want to do that, if our fellow students today want to do that, they will achieve comparable recognition to what I've had. Mm -hmm. Great point. Yeah, I totally agree with that. And uh, thank you for sharing your perspective on this. Um, now let's move to something different here. Um, if you want to talk about the global engagement and recognition. So your professional engagement span across multiple countries. How has working on international projects and collaborations influenced your approach to petroleum engineering challenges? Well, it has, it has broadened my perspective, to, to state it simply. To, to to talk to people about their problems and quite often the problems are as much people problems as technical problems yeah you know and so I have become acquainted with it with the personal perspective of people in all sorts of cultures yeah. throughout the world and I found you know fundamentally we're all alike yes we have common interests uh, but because of these different cultural backgrounds, this this may lead to different ways that we have to get organized to solve technical problems. Now, the technical problems that I've dealt with internationally have really been pretty much the same yeah. as in the U.S. You know, problems with reserves, which a lot of my recent work has been with, problems in reservoir description and integrated reservoir studies, uh, uh, we have the same kinds of technical problems, but the way that we approach them, the way that we organize to approach these problems, it does depend on the local, local culture. Yeah. Uh, we never want to take the position that, well, we're from, uh, from the U.S. where the petroleum technology, you know, really, really got advanced early. Yes. Uh, n you never want to take that point of view. Everybody has their contributions and their advances and you need to learn this and respect what others have done. So, you know, the main thing I've learned is, is about different peoples in different areas and the importance of recognizing the contributions that people throughout the world have, have made and mm -hmm. are making. Yeah. I really appreciate your perspective on this because it's not only like the technical uh, challenges, let's say, that are different, but also like dealing with people from different cultures and working environment. So thank you. All right. Um, just before ending this uh, conversation, which is really exciting, um, you know, now uh, everyone is talking about the future of oil and gas industry and petroleum engineering major. So given your vast experience, how do you foresee the future of oil and gas industry considering ongoing global developments and increasing focus on sustainable energy? Well, we face a, a, another challenge, and we need we need to be informed and and able to advocate for what we believe to be what will be of the most help to the most people most of the time. Uh, you sort of I think uh, informally alluded to the fact that politically our industry is out of favor yeah. with many people in this country and other countries. Nevertheless, uh, the world has a strong need for reliable energy sources at a reasonable cost. Now, what these energy sources are, that's going to change. Yeah. Uh, you know, we've, we've certainly seen a dramatic increase in the n demand for natural gas, uh, and uh, a lot of opposition to oil sources like uh, heavy oils, like in the Canadian oil sands, for example. 
uh, we have to, you know, understand that these events are occurring and learn how to deal with them. But uh, even the U.S. Energy Admis uh, Information Administration, mm -hmm. if you look at its forecast yeah. for oil and gas demand in the year 2050, last yeah. time I looked, yeah. it was uh, a forecast that the demand would be greater than it is today. Okay. And so that says for many decades yes. in the future, uh -huh. there's going to be a need for oil and gas. Yeah, there's, there's, there are environmental concerns. Yeah. We need to accept these. But people in the world need reliable energy sources at a reasonable cost to develop their economies. Mm -hmm. So we have to respect the needs for the environment, and we have to respect the needs for these reliable energy sources and do the best we can to try to reconcile uh, these these differences and do what's best for the world. Yeah, I totally agree with that. As someone deeply connected to petroleum engineering education, what changes or trends do you anticipate in the curriculum and focus areas for petroleum engineering majors? Well, you know, w w we've seen a number of important changes recently, and I think they will accelerate. Uh, you know, as information technology mm -hmm. has advanced. Uh, the petroleum industry has taken uh, a greater and greater interest in that because we have a tremendous amount of information that we need to learn how to handle. In fact, yeah. we have a whole lot more information than we've been able to handle successfully in the past. Mm -hmm. That's just an example of saying that as technology throughout the world uh, advances, uh, we need to have a look at that and see how does that affect the petroleum industry. So we have that need. Uh, we have these environmental concerns yeah. about traditional oil and gas and what we do to recover the traditional oil and gas. Well, uh, to provide this abundant, cheap energy source, we do have to look at realistic additional sources of energy like geothermal for example yes. which you know which uh, doesn't cause any environmental harm uh, it does provide a source of energy it yeah. you know hopefully it's going to get cheaper and cheaper yeah. but we can contribute to these non-traditional sources of energy yeah. and we as petroleum engineers don't be afraid don't need to be afraid of moving beyond Fossil like fuels. Yes. We have we have the fundamentals, and we need to provide the training on those fundamentals in our schools mm -hmm. that can help people uh, deal with these. Carbon dioxide storage, yeah. CCUS, mm -hmm. is, is a growing area of interest in technology, which petroleum engineers are uniquely equipped to yes. handle with. Well, we need to provide more education in areas like that. Now, mm -hmm. there's so many areas, uh, we might say, well, how are we going to do this? Because we keep the students pretty busy yeah. as, 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 as things stand now. How can we add more things like information technology and right. geothermal and uh, carbon dioxide storage, et cetera? I think the answer is we need to focus more and more on fundamentals uh -huh. and not worry so much about the details of the technology of the day. Okay. That technology of the day, it's going to change yeah. just as it's been changing. The fundamentals mm -hmm. are not going to change. Yeah, fundamentals sure. of physics, math, chemistry, engineering sciences, those are not going to change. Sure. We need to focus on that equip people to be able to learn technologies as they develop in industry in the future. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's really interesting and exciting. So um, for students aspiring, and this is the last question, so for students aspiring to pursue a career in petroleum engineering, what advice do you have considering the dynamic nature of the industry and the diverse roles available, like as you mentioned, carbon storage, geothermal. So what advice do you have for the aspiring petroleum engineering students? First, get a good grasp of fundamentals. Mm -hmm. In school and, and after graduation from a university, mm -hmm. get that good grasp of fundamentals and maintain that good grasp. Be a lifelong learner. Mm -hmm. Keep taking short courses, maybe 
courses by distance learning, formal university courses, even though that's kind of hard to do after a long day at work. It's a good thing to do, so be a lifetime learner. Get very involved in professional societies like SBE. Mm -hmm. That is going to be of huge benefit long term. Get involved immediately after graduation. Of course, I know people like you and uh, many of our students here at A&M are already getting deeply involved while students. I hope everyone maintains that interest. It's paid off in my career. It will pay off in yours. Okay. Okay. These are really great advice. All right. Uh, I think with this, we come to an end for our podcast. In wrapping this uh, episode of Energy Matters, we extend our sincere appreciation to you, Professor Lee, for generously sharing your wealth of knowledge and insights into the intricate realms of energy industry and petroleum engineering. Thank you for making this podcast an enlightening exploration of crucial issues shaping the future of our energy. And for our listeners, thank you for tuning in and we'll see you in our next podcast. Okay. Thank you.